Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning, the scripture text is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, and I'm going to start reading at verse 24. This is what it says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and burst against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who builds his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and burst against that house and it fell and great was its fall. The result was that when Jesus had finished these words, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Pray with me. Jesus, this is your day. Use it that our, our lives might be consecrated, made firm, and you the true foundation. Amen. It was a little, little over a hundred years ago, the great architect Frank Lloyd Wright was asked to build the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, Japan. He went to the site to look to see where the, the hotel was to be built. What he discovered shocked him. The soil was only about eight feet deep, and below eight feet, it was just a slurry of mud. He knew that there in Tokyo, there was a tendency for earthquakes. Most folks would have been discouraged and said, thanks, but no thanks. I don't want my name attached to to a hotel, to a building that's built on such an infirm foundation. But Frank Lloyd Wright had an idea an idea how to create a a foundation that would hold. And Frank Lloyd Wright, the great architect, he knew about foundations, foundations that would hold. But not only that, he knew that they had trouble with earthquakes, and during the earthquake, when pipes would burst, that fire became a problem. So he insisted that an extra large pool be built there for that hotel. September 1923, Tokyo had its worst earthquake in history. Over 140,000 people died during that earthquake. Frank Lloyd Wright was called by a newspaper. And they said, we've heard rumor that, that your building fell. Frank Lloyd Wright said, you can print that if you want to, but you'll have to print a, a retraction. I built a foundation that would hold And I know that that building's still standing. Not soon after that, he did get that phone call. His was one of the few that withstood the earthquake. And not only that, the pool that he insisted on being built was used to put out fires all around the building and to help the other buildings as well. Frank Lloyd Wright knew something about foundations. But the point of the story this morning is not Frank Lloyd Wright. It's not building. It's not construction. It's a life. It's a life. 
And Jesus Christ tells you and me about a foundation that holds. And he starts at the, at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and he give, gives us this story. And the first words that he gives us of this story is the word, therefore. What therefore does is it points to everything that happened before. Every time the Bible has the word therefore, you, you, we need to ask ourselves, what's the therefore, therefore? It means it, it references something that, that, that he's already said, something that happened in the past. And Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, it starts. It starts with some of the most familiar words in, in the whole of the New Testament. It starts with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. He points all the way back to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, that life is hard. That there are times that this life will deplete our spirits. And so we're poor in spirit. There are times in this life that mourning will bring us to our knees. Life is hard. There are times in this life where the courage is sucked right out of us and, and we're nothing but meek. Life is hard. But even in the, the hard, difficult times of life, God is good. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. Life is hard, but God is good. He gives us blessing. Even in the hard time, even in the most difficult time, in one of those Chicken Soup for the Soul books, Dr. James C. Brown tells a story about one of his patients, Bobby. Bobby was four, five years old. He had been battling leukemia since he was four years old. He'd gone through the chemo. He'd gone through the, the treatments. He knew the nausea. He knew the fatigue. He knew the, the poking and prodding, the needles that were required for the chemotherapy. And this particular day, he was in for another day of poking and prodding and chemotherapy. He started off the therapy by, by turning to the doctor and everyone around him, the nurses and technicians, saying, you don't need to hold me down. I've been through this before. Well, then he turned to the doctor and he said, Dr. Brown, do you mind if I say the 23rd Psalm while you're giving me the treatment? Dr. Brown said, sure, that'd be fine. So he started off, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Perfectly, he recited the 23rd Psalm. They had finished their poking and prodding. And then at the end of it, he turned to Dr. Brown and he said, Dr. Brown, it really didn't hurt that much. To which the technicians, nurses, and Dr. Brown all knew that that wasn't the case. Then he turned to Dr. Brown and he said, Dr. Brown, do you know the 23rd Psalm? Dr. Brown said, sure I do. He said, can you recite it like me? Well, then the other nurses and technicians were looking for a place to hide, afraid that Bobby might call on them. Dr. Brown said, well, I think so. He said, then, then can you say it? Well, Dr. Brown started in. It wasn't quite as smooth. It wasn't quite as polished. hadn't been said quite as often as Bobby had, but he got to the end of it. And that's when Bobby said this. He said, you know, you really should learn the 23rd Psalm by heart because when you say it out loud, God hears you and lets you know inside your heart that he is being strong for you when you can't be strong for yourself. Bobby knows the foundation that holds. It's the good shepherd. Jesus Christ, yes, life is hard, but God is good. And he's the good shepherd that rose from the grave to make his home, not off up in heaven, but in our hearts to give us strength when we don't have it. Jesus Christ is the foundation that holds. Life is hard, 
but God is good. The second thing that I wanted to talk about this morning is that, well, people are hard, but forgiveness is possible. The therefore points back to what's been said before. And I realize I'm taking a, a, a broad stroke across the, the Sermon on the Mount. And in chapter 6, the tone changes very much. In the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6 starts off where Jesus is talking about hypocrisy. People who say one thing, but then they do something totally different than what they say. And he specifically talks about three different things. Giving, the giving of alms. He talks about prayer, and he talks about fasting. Three things that were intended as gifts to, to give honor to God. Three things that were intended as gifts to give thanks to God, give praise to God. And, and in the case of alms and prayer, also to help others as well. And so in the, the middle of the talking about hypocrites, Jesus offers instruction. Instruction. And that instruction in the very center of it is the Lord's Prayer. And in the center of the Lord's Prayer, he says, forgive us. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Joel grew up on a farm. He tells a lot of stories about growing up on a farm. One of his stories is about his father who would take him every weekend to town. They would spend the weekends in town on Saturday. And then at 5 o'clock, he would head back, back home, back to the farm. Joel asked him one Saturday, asked his father if it would be all right if he stuck around after 5 o'clock to watch a basketball game, and he would get a ride with a friend home afterward. Well, his friend forgot him, and he was left to walk home after dark one night along that, that long country road that re led to his farm. As he was walking along the gravel road, he saw some headlights coming up behind him. He knew he was in luck. Everybody who traveled that road lived somewhere along and was a neighbor. They might be several miles away, but he knew everyone who lived along that road, so he stuck his thumb out. The car stopped, rolled down the window, and that's when his heart sank. It was Mr. Jim. Mr. Jim was the town character. He was born sour, and he had a relapse every morning. He was a cantankerous fellow that lived about two miles past where Jim lived. And uh, he asked him, he said, Mr. Jim, can I have a ride home? Mr. Jim said, hop in. He got in the car. Not a lot of discussion as they drove along. Mr. Jim stopped at the end of Joel's driveway. And when Joel got out, he said, thanks, Mr. Jim, for the ride. I really do appreciate it. And that's when Mr. Jim said it. He said, thanks. Thanks is mighty poor pay. Well, Joel was so embarrassed. He didn't have any money. He said, Mr. Jim, I don't have any money. If I did, I'd, I'd give it to you, uh, but I really do appreciate the ride. And Mr. Jim said it again. He said, thanks is mighty poor pay. And then he drove off. Well, after that, Joel was so embarrassed every time he saw Mr. Jim in town. If he was on the sidewalk, Joel would duck into, the, into a store. And if Mr. Jim was in the store, then Joel would duck out into the sidewalk the end of high school and beginning of college, Joel got a job. And then all throughout college, he saved enough to buy a car. So when he entered seminary, he was able to, to drive home on the weekends. Well, he came home one Saturday night. It was late. He was coming down that long country road that led to his farm, and there was a man walking along the road. You guessed it. It was Mr. Jim. He stopped and rolled down his window and said, do you need a ride, Mr. Jim? Mr. Jim got in his car, didn't say a whole lot. They drove past Joel's house, about two or three miles to Mr. Jim's house, and, and Joel didn't just drop him off there at the end of the driveway. He drove him all the way down the driveway to his house. And when Mr. Jim got out, he said, thanks, Joel, I appreciate it. And you know what Joel said? Well, you know exactly what Joel wanted to say. 
<laughs> that there's something deep on the inside of us that we want payback. There's something deep on the inside of us that, that we want people to get what their due is. There's something deep on the inside of us that really wants to move around to the judge's side of the bench. But that's not what Joel did. Joel said, sure, Mr. Jim, any time. Joel, Joel had the foundation that holds. It's Jesus Christ that when he gave his life on the cross for you and for me, for Joel and for Mr. Jim, he died on the cross to forgive. And that forgiveness, well, it's what's to be practiced every time we say the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us. Forgive us. It's not that, that Jesus is reluctant to give us forgiveness. It's that we're reluctant to ask. And so it requires that we practice. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. People are hard. But forgiveness is possible. That when Jesus forgave you and me on the cross, he didn't just say, well, forgiven, now good luck from now on. No, he rose from the grave to give you and me power to forgive others as well. That's the foundation that holds. And that's the foundation that's available to you and to me. Jesus provided it through the cross and the resurrection. Well, people are hard. But forgiveness is possible. Life is hard, but God is good. And the third thing that I wanted to talk about this morning, that here in this story, Jesus talks about a foundation that's hold. He, a foundation that holds, and, and that firm foundation, well, he says that it's, it's everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to the man who built the the house upon the rock, that he's pointing to, to those words that he's, that he's said before, those words that he pointed to before. And all of this is summed up in verse 28. The result was that when Jesus had finished these words, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching. Multitudes amazed. Multitudes. Whenever the Bible uses that word multitudes, often it's talking about 5,000, and Jesus fed them. We're talking about 4,000, and Jesus fed them. Multitudes, thousands were amazed. But Jesus only had a couple of handfuls of followers. Jesus calls followers, not admirers. Jesus calls followers, not admirers. And that's the last thing that I want to talk about this morning. Some of you know the name... Christopher Parkening. Christopher Parkening is one of the greatest classical guitarists in the world. He's traveled all over the world playing in orchestras. Not only that, he's played for presidents in the White House. Christopher Parkening is, is a very gifted musician, one of the greatest classical guitar players in the world. But not only that, that uh, <laughs> he's also world champion fly fisherman in casting, that he's won the world champion. Wow, what a combination. And Christopher Parkening knows the foundation that holds, and I'll share it in his own words. This is what he says, by the age 30, I had achieved all my dreams in the musical world. But I was tired of the grinding schedule of hotel rooms, performances, and recording sessions. It was time to go fishing. With the money I'd earned, I found and purchased my dream stream on a ranch in Montana. I stopped playing the guitar. I called my recording company and management group at Columbia and told them I had no desire to play anymore. I'd earned enough from my music that I didn't need to work anyway. For several years, I did everything I wanted. I learned every trout stream in the area and fished to my heart's content. But as time went by, I became very unhappy with my life. I don't know how to describe it, but my life became boring to me. It was totally empty. 
When you arrive at a point in your life where you have everything you ever wanted, everything you ever thought that would make you happy, and it still doesn't, then you start questioning things. I had the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and yet I thought, well, what's left? What's missing? While in California visiting friends, I attended a church where I heard a sermon entitled, Examine Yourself Whether You Are in the Faith. The preacher said that you could know all about Christ, know all about the Bible, even address him as Lord, and Jesus might say to you, depart from me, I never knew you. You never did the will of my Father. I was convinced if I had died that night, Jesus would have spoken those very words to me. Though my parents had introduced me to the Christian faith when I was young, and though I was baptized and read the Bible occasionally, I had never really done God's will. I suppose I wanted to be saved from hell, but I never wanted a Lord of my life that I should follow and trust and obey unconditionally. So I went home that day, broken over my selfish ways, and I prayed that Christ would be both Lord and Savior of my life. I surrendered the control of my life over to Him. I developed a great hunger for the Word of God and started reading the Bible in earnest. Soon I came across a passage that said, Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. I realized there were only two things I knew how to do. Fly fish for trout and play the guitar. Well, I am playing the guitar today absolutely by the grace of God. I have a joy, a peace, a deep down fulfillment in my life I've never had before. My life has purpose. My desire is to glorify God and His Son, Jesus Christ, with my life and my music. The great composer J.S. Bach once said, The aim and final reason of all music is none else but the glory of God. I'm giving my life and my music over to God. I've learned firsthand the true secret of genuine happiness. Christopher Parkening knows the foundation that holds His name is Jesus Christ. And my question for you this morning is, do you know? Do you know Jesus as your Lord? Do you know Him as your Savior? Do you know Him as the Lord who's the leader in your life? Do you know Him as Savior? Do you trust that what what He did on the cross was enough to forgive your sin. This morning, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, I want to invite you to do that. It may be that one time long ago, you did receive Jesus as your Lord. You did receive Him as your Savior, but you've gotten off that road. And I want to invite you to pray with me as well. It may be that you are following Jesus as Lord and you are following Jesus as Savior. And I don't need to tell you, I want to invite you to pray with me as well for folks who might receive the power of the risen Christ, His Spirit this day. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, it's a day for foundation a foundation that holds. Our lives may have been shaken. They may have been blown around. And they, they may have been changed that fear may have set in. And, and Lord, we may have been looking to other foundations other than you. There's no life in it. That you, Jesus, are the, the foundation that holds. This morning... Grant that all those who hear my voice may may receive your grace and know that you are Lord. You are the leader. You are the one that gives a sense of purpose through your Holy Spirit. Grant strength for that foundation. Lord, there may be those that, that want to follow you, but they don't trust. They don't trust that what you did on the cross was enough. 
And never before have they turned to you and said, yes. Yes, I, I will follow you as Lord. I will trust you as Savior. And this is that day. By the power of your Holy Spirit, breathe. Breathe on, on these and give them your strength that they may know you are the good shepherd. Life is hard, but Lord, you are good. Lord, people are hard, but we know that forgiveness is possible. Jesus, this day, may we hear your call on our lives, that you've called us to be followers and not just admirers. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life, and my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.